Hi, I'm Anthony Kelly, and I teach in the Department of Music at Duke University. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Spring Composition and Theory Showcase. We have some really exciting pieces by some really promising composers, some of whom uh, have worked within a counterpoint course, one of whom is in the midst of his first semester of ever studying composition, that's Ben Rubin, and three of whom are in their second semester. So they presented some of their works that they have composed between the first and second, second semesters. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoy them all. Uh, we're gonna have them play their pieces for you first. And then around the 33 minute mark, you'll be able to hear interviews with the composers who wrote the pieces that you just heard, if you wanna hear you know, how they thought about their own work. So again, thanks for joining us and enjoy.
Here are four, you know, of the voices of the future in, in composition. <laughs> but in some ways, you also represent um, a reflection of past practice. You've all written pieces that we're going to have as a portion of the uh, theory and composition showcase. Now, I'm going to start with Roy. And, and tell me what you think about that question. Where, where do theory and, and counterpoint meet? And where do they veer off and, 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 and change your course as a composer? Um, yeah, I guess for the previous theory classes, um, like we thought more like in terms of harmony. So I guess like when we were writing music, I guess I thought more like vertically. Um, whereas like with counterpoint, um, feels like we started thinking like more like horizontally. So like each voice as being independent rather than like being as like um like a note in a chord. But I guess um like the two approaches kind of overlap because like whenever we have more than one voice at a time, like there's some kind of implied harmony going on. So um like they're kind of different, but I feel like they overlap in a way too. Jerry, um, you have uh, also some experience. You have a good background in theory, such a good background that you, you're able to sort of override one of our, our theory courses. Congratulations on that, by the way. And, uh, but you have that solid background. And I was wondering, like, where, you know, where were you with CounterPoint before this class? And, and how much is it um, sort of altering or enhancing where you are now as a composer and musical thinker? Um, well, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I think my music theory background is probably a bit, um, at the very least, it's been less structured than of the other students in, in this class. So, um, yeah, in some ways, maybe you could say, um, yeah, I, I'm um counterpoint is maybe a uh, less of a large step away because you know i never really had that structured um kind of progression in music theory um but yeah i mean um i think you know the music theory classes that i've experienced before um it's kind of been about learning about kind of the the rules that make certain music up whereas i think the emphasis in this counterpoint class um, has is quite a large shift away, which is um, sure we're thinking about a lot of the rules that help make some of you know this really great music happen, 
Um, but also, as we've seen time and time again in this class, um, composers are very happy to break some of these rules as long as it makes the music more powerful. Um, so I think it's kind of um, like a, like an in theory versus in practice kind of thing um, in terms of yeah music theory versus counterpoint. Um, so Vincentius, uh, uh, Roy brought up the sort of Bach is, was a big model for this. I remember you were in the theory sequence, and so you remember Bach as a chorale composer. And now we're thinking of Bach as a composer of many, many, many fugues and many, many inventions and, and, and different, um, different forms that specifically involve more than one line going simultaneously. Um, how do you... How do you frame your perception of Bach now that you've seen more of the picture of who he is as a composer? I realize, like you know, just how amazing he is. But I think, what I think, all of that, and like um, considering that um, all the theory, um, like you know, all, all the theory he invented, we we learn from him, and to see like um, decide on him uh, of him with um, all the counterpoint, I think it's really amazing, and for me. Counterpoint is actually like a part of the music theory. Like it's not like where they meet. It's actually like a part of the music theory. But we've been looking at Bach into sixty one more into like uh, homophonics or in the in the choral style and um, you know studying him in all this counterpoint, having all the voices moving independently. I think I think it's just an amazing fit. So Nathaniel. Um... Where does your, because you're known, you're a known quantity at Duke as quite a pianist, you're a great performer, and uh, where does Counterpoint meet you as a performer, and does it enhance your your work in, in the execution of musical endeavors? So prior to this class, a lot of my Bach experience, yes, we had learned some of like the chorale type settings in 261, but a lot of my Bach experience on the piano was dealing with some of these uh, fugues, as well as the inventions and even uh, French suites, which utilized a lot of um, counterpoint. And so I was aware of, of counterpoint as an entity in Bach's writing, um, but I was not very familiar with the concept of implementing it myself in writing. Um, and so this class has been kind of the bridge between like my observations of Bach in playing the piano and my abilities to, you know, utilize the harmonies that we learned in 261 and 361 um, to utilize those in a contrapuntal form of writing um, that was not really focused on in those courses. So this course has certainly helped, you know, bridge some of that background for me in terms of what I have played into now what I am writing. And I feel like it has definitely enhanced um, my ability to write. I think kind of going off of what Jerry said about like the difference between theory and application, um, like the theory courses, we certainly learn the theory, but now with the counterpoint, we are learning how to apply it in ways that uh, we didn't learn necessarily in 261. And so that is something that I found really really engaging in this course. Well, let's get to the specific pieces that you chose. Um, and uh, there's a variety of pieces between inventions because one of your one of your first pieces that you composed uh, was a canon, which means a piece that just imitates itself. A lot like we, we sing row, row, row your boat um, uh, and, and we have it staggered and it still works out harmonically. Uh, all of the students were required to create original pieces that are structured like that. Um, and I noticed that, Jerry, you, you included your, your canon as one of the pieces that we might listen to. Uh, talk to us about creating a, a canon and, and compare that to your creation of an invention. What, what was the difference to you? And did you find one more restrictive and or liberating than the other? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well... Yeah, I mean, so our, our, one of our first assignments was to write um, a canon, and um, I found this to actually be to be much harder than the invention, or at least much more restrictive. Um, so with the you know two part invention, um, 
we have certain rules about counterpoint that we should be following, but um, in general, the lines are still very free to to kind of do whatever they need to do in order to make the music flow very naturally, or um, if you want to lead the harmony in, in whatever specific direction. Um, with the can, however, um, I found it pretty challenging to um, to keep the music moving, uh, sorry, to keep the music moving um, while uh, kind of keeping the harmonies uh, interesting um, because the basic rule of the canon is that um, one voice will be introducing some new material and then after a short um, period of time, the second voice will be um, imitating that. Um, and if it's a true canon, it should be exactly. Um, so basically that means you have to be very careful with the types of notes you're going to be choosing uh, and making sure all of your counterpoint lines up. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a very different experience writing the canon versus the prevention. I feel like with the canon, it was kind of almost like building a puzzle where you try to figure out exactly what kinds of notes you can even use um, to make the music flow properly. Um, and with the invention, it was a lot more free. Roy, um, uh, you have you know, dazzled us with a, a complete fugue, which is, uh, you know, that's, you know, maybe one of the culmination points for our building towards, uh, you know, accomplishment within Counterpoint in the style of Bach. And um, talk to us a little bit about some aspects of a fugue that you learned from Bach that you integrated into your own fugue. And if you want to, Tell us any places where you put Roy's spin on the few. Um, yeah, so I guess we studied like the fugues and the well-tempered clavier a lot. Um, so I guess um, one thing I um, learned from Bach is like how he structures like the exposition of the fugue. Um, so like, when he's introducing each new voice, um, we kind of studied like, um, like um, on what keys like he introduces um, each uh, the subject in, as well as like sometimes like the order with which he introduces the voices. Um, so that's something I um, drew upon in my fugue, and um, another thing. Um, notice is that he uses a lot of like episodes um, in his fugues, and like these episodes usually have um, contain sequences, and so um, yeah, I used a lot of like kind of those sequential material in my fugue as well, and that helps take up some space as well. So, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Other than that, um, yeah, I noticed that like Bach uses a lot of like imitation and different like um, contrapuntal devices in his fugues. Um, so yeah, I drew upon a lot of that um, when writing my own fugue. Nathaniel, I know that um, you're writing a fugue now, and I have noticed that there are little signs of some of the techniques like inversion showing up. Did you end up using any witty contrapuntal techniques in your invention? Um, a little bit. So in the in the invention, I wanted to obviously emulate the idea of box invention inventions. Um, but one thing I wanted to add to my invention was perhaps a little bit more lyricism, uh, where a lyrical line is a little bit more apparent while still adher adhering to, you know, the style of box inventions, which I think if I'm not incorrect, were primarily to instruct the performer in the details and necessities of playing with two hands separately um, and developing those skills. So the inventions were, I think, intended more as an exercise for the pianist. And so I was going after that but I wanted to include perhaps a bit more lyricism. And so when composing, I was obviously trying to be very cognizant of um, the lines and the harmonies 
not just focusing on the invention aspect of it. So if we look here at the uh, beginning, we have kind of these sustained uh, notes that descend uh, chromatically, and it adds a sort of melody that is repeated again in the right hand in the next few measures. And I try and utilize this idea throughout the entire piece uh, as it is basically my, my main motive. And our counter motive is just some running six uh, eighth notes behind it. Um, now an element of kind of like box tools that he pulls from with inversion, diminution, augmentation. Uh, the one that I used was is kind of like an extension um, here at the end. Uh, so we have this this main statement again, but it continue continues down the keyboard, and it's just an extension of of the original theme. Um, and that's something Bach sometimes uses, especially towards the end of his fugues. He will prolong something to exaggerate the fact that we are at the end, and so I tried to utilize that idea in in my writing. Another another thing that I utilized as well was, um, I guess, fragmentation, just using parts of the entrances. So if we look at measure forty and forty two, uh, you have the entrance, what you would consider the entrance of the main subject but it is cut short both times. And so I know Bach, that is something Bach utilizes. And so that was something I thought I would try to do as well. And Cynthia, you explored something that we rarely get in a counterpoint class, which is a, 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 an entirely reframed orchestration project. And so what I want you to do is tell uh, listeners about the, your instrumental choice and show the score and talk about what you had to do to compensate for the difference between what Bach normally composed for and what you're composing for. Um, so I'm making the invention for um, classical guitar. Um, the main restriction of the classical guitar is um, the hardness of playing, uh, playing in the key that has flat. So starting from uh, F major, I think F major is fine, but like moving on from that is getting harder because um, each flat uh, destroy one of the open string, making it one uh, unusable. Like if you have B flat, then the, B, the open B string is not usable. So the main reason I'm doing um, A minor is because of that. Uh, there is nothing much different aside from that. Actually, the nice thing with the invention, you only have two voices, and uh, two voices is almost playable in guitar, unless you have like um, something that just like you know from very low f to very high that's that's unreachable but two voice in general is pretty playable in guitar even like um bach and uh, a minor invention um is really playable so i'm making the um let's see the top lines um mostly played on the um on the first three strings which is the bottom the bottom three strings um and the uh, um the bottom line, the the bass, which uh, played on the on the bass string, which is the top uh, three, three strings on, on the guitar, and it's always it's always like that. So, for example, um, I'll just pick like a random spot, like in this case, it's just an open E string, and this is like uh, which is like the bottom most string on the guitar, and this is like the uh, top most string on the guitar, which is played on the fourth position of the, of the G sharp. So it's actually made, uh, not really challenging with just two voices and. Lots of uh, Bach music is actually really playable, um, even on the classical guitar, which I actually don't really go for a few because it's getting harder for three voices uh, having to manage uh, this, this restriction on the classical guitar. But I'm really happy with, you know, um, being able to write um, an invention for, for my um, own instrument that I play. So, Jerry, uh if you don't mind doing a share of your score of your invention as well and tell us about any uh any things that you would want a listener to to not miss a little any any uh measures or any moments that you think really capture you know something either surprising or remarkable about the piece uh sure um 
Yeah, so with my invention, I was um, mainly just trying to go for uh, Bach's kind of lightness um, that he goes with for many of his inventions. Um, uh, so just overall trying to create that kind of playful tone. Um, and part of that included um, some harmonic choices that maybe Bach wouldn't have gone with. Um, so for example, over here, um, I'm pretty happy with how this surprising modulation turned out. Um, so going from B flat minor and then uh, kind of using some chromatics to transfer to this G chord, which goes to C major. Um, so uh, yes, so this is kind of just a little harmonic trick that um, I think works pretty well in this piece and still maintains, you know, roughly the style that Bach might have been using. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, throughout this piece, I, of course, I'm using uh, Bach style imitation um, and, uh, you know, Bach, Bach uses imitation um, throughout many of his inventions. Um, Kind of in a subtle way to develop some of his motifs. Um, so, for example, um, at the beginning here, you know, my main idea is this sixteenth note run with some large leaps inside of it, um, and with these sequential patterns, I'm kind of changing the shape of how the leap functions within um, the sixteenth note run here in measure four, and then again over here. Um, around measure 15, where I've changed the figure a bit again. So um, yeah, kind of uh, keeping the general ideas of the motif, uh, but also changing you know, some, some characteristics of the overall shape. Um, so it's still kind of all feels related, but not entirely the same. And again, uh, continues to feel very light. Um, and then finally, at the very end, um, I'm pretty happy with how this ending turned out. Um, it's very almost too easy, um, just kind of very obvious uh, chaining these these thirds, these two voices in a third apart. Um, but I thought the effect was pretty nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a very simple counterpoint line with the two voices uh, stacked a third away. And I think the effect is pretty nice. It's a really nice choice for an ending and also kind of reminds me of when we were looking at the music of August Klingel, who, who sometimes would do runs, you know, for six and thirds for, you know, a really substantial amount of, of, of the music, especially in the 16th notes. And so it's almost like you kind of brought a bit of, of, of uh, his um, canonic world into, into Bach's uh, compositional style as well. Um, lastly, as a share, uh, Roy, if you don't mind, if you can pull up your fugue and, and talk to us a little bit about, like, just overall scheme, like, like, you know, how did you plan to go from one major section to another major section? You talked about an exposition and, a, like, a development section and a sort of a recap. And if you could just, like, show us, like, what those three things are made of but you don't have to get down into the woods just kind of big picture and how did you like strategize creating those yeah so um yeah so my exposition um yeah um, I guess I just um, like outline the subject in the tonic and the dominant keys. And so, yeah, the subject kind of ends here. I like the 13th measure. And then I guess big picture after the subject to kind of like have um, a small episode um, before like I state the um, subject again. And I guess in terms of planning, um, I kind of like planned out um, each time I presented the subject, like which key it would be in. So after the exposition, um, 
the first time I state the subject, it's in the key of um, F sharp minor, which is like the um, median in the home key of D major. And then after that, I kind of plan to like repeat the subject again um, in ascending fourths, um, creating like a, um, like kind of following the circle of fifths. So after the exposition, I present the subject in F sharp minor. And then if you kind of track it, it goes to like B minor and then up a fourth to E minor and then as well to A major, which is the dominant. And then I guess in terms of a recap, kind of like have a really short recap, which is at the very end. So after the subject's been presented in A major, I go up a fourth one last time. So we're back to the home key of D major. And then, so the last time I present the subject is kind of actually um, incomplete. So I kind of cut off the end of the subject to help create um, a cadence to help bring the piece to a close. Yeah. Thank you for that. It was a really great overview. So to anyone, and this is just my last request, does anyone have any uh, last observations or comments that you want to, uh, to before we go away? I will also give a shout out to our very able and distinguished teaching assistant who is doing a cameo in this appearance, Susie Ling, who's been also guiding us in the practicalities of, of, of contrapuntal writing. So thank you for joining us and thank you for helping guide the students as well, Susie. Well, you've done great. So thank you for what you've said. And I'm going to stop the recording on this end. All right, we've got music 381T, and it used to be, last semester, it used to be called music 281T, because that was the first semester that all three of these promising composers um, began their journey of studying composition formally at Duke. Um, I was the lucky professor who got to, to uh, work with all three of these students, and um, we're going to just get a few perspectives on their trajectories from where they started. And then what I would like to ask each one of them is uh, to talk a little bit about the piece that they're going to hear in the Composer Theory Showcase. So we'll start with Vincentius. Um, Vincentius, tell us a little bit about what happened last semester. and. Um, and uh, how you felt as a composer and, you know, how you put your piece together. And then maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, how, what the piece is made of, what, what features you would like us to hear, and maybe tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days as well. Right. So, um, right, I took to 81 um, last semester, and it's always been like, you know, um, I guess my desire since like a very long time uh, to really like um, making music. When I first like um, joined the music theory, I really just thought actually like, you know, maybe I could just do one music theory and make music, but it wasn't that easy. Like, you know, composition does require um, or like, you know, some in-depth study uh, outside just just the just the theory. And um, it's actually in, um, in my, you know, life goal of uh, making um, this, um, the the piece I made last semester, which is actually um, a gamelan, Indonesian gamelan inspired piece. Um, so I've been, I've been thinking, I had that crazy idea since like, you know, a very long time, like seriously, maybe like two years or something. Um, I, I didn't think it was, it was possible back then. I was like, who would think such a crazy idea? I mean, yeah. No, <laughs> um, so I decided like to just go on it last semester. Um, I didn't know whether you know I would I would be able to make it because um, I didn't I did I wasn't really that in love with gamelan either. But um, you know I I came here I was far away from my hometown um, and you know some 
part of this like cultures just I just I just miss that so I started like studying um some aspect of the gamelan so the piece I made is called uh, Tulusoran Nusantara it's basically three words from three different languages which basically mean like um three different voices um so I incorporated these three different um gamelan types so the first one the main one is from my uh, hometown is a Sundanese gamelan it's basically like um a slow moving um kind of like Fijian based um movement and the second one is more like you know like more a minor alien based which is Japanese gamelan um I was trying to incorporate some of some of the Balinese gamelan as well which is like somewhere in the middle part um in the triplet section um it's kind of like slower than what it's supposed to be just because it's actually harder to play than uh, than what I thought so I made it slower but um I did plan on like, incorporating these three different styles of gamelan and um yeah somehow somehow it just, it just happened and uh, I think I was also really proud with how it turned out yeah, it's a beautiful piece guitar and flute mm-hmm. um just before we move on to Bryn who's going to be next and you can start queuing up your ideas on those questions Bryn um, I do want to ask uh, Vincentius one more thing, and I'll also ask Brent and Alex to follow up on. Were there any um, pieces that uh, that we did as an analysis that inspired what you did? Right. So um, the first time <laughs> I look into this, um, it uh, the first piece that came out when I googled this out is like uh, Debussy. Um, is there Estampes from Pagodes? Um, so Debussy actually went to, he didn't go to Indonesia, but like I think he went to a showcase or something where uh, he saw Gamelan and he just started studying it. So I was like, you know, if he could do it, then <laughs> I might be able to do it as well. So I studied um, Estampes from, from Debussy. Thanks a lot, Vincentius. Okay, Bryn. So the question, the beginning question is, uh, can you track for us your journey from music 281 and beginning to explore composition from that perspective of course you came to the table with some composition in the pocket because you had written some vocal music already but um tell us about you know <laughs> the, the sticker shot of, of of studying it formally at duke compared to you know what you were doing before and tell us about like how it led to the piece that we're going to hear for solo oboe what inspired that piece and what you're up to these days Yeah, so Dr. Kelly kind of hinted at this, but I had written a little bit of vocal music, mostly choral vocal music, um, before coming to Duke. Um, It was just sort of a passion of mine that I did on the side, didn't do too much formal study on it. Um, But 281 was a pretty structured class in that when we were writing our pieces, the first piece we were asked to write was a one-line piece. And I, I... had never really written anything for just one line before. I'd always had multiple parts to kind of lean back on. And at that point, I knew I kind of wanted to stretch myself past just writing for the voice, but knew that I had some strength and experience in writing for voice. So wanted to write for something that wasn't necessarily too far off the beaten path from what the voice was. So I chose to write for a wind instrument because there are some similarities in terms of, you know, what the human body can do and what a wind instrument can do. Like both for both, you need to breathe, for instance. So phrasing is really important. So I decided I'd write for oboe because I think it's a really beautiful, unique instrument. And I, um, we had been shown a piece in class called Six Metamorphoses After Ovid by um, Britton, Benjamin Britton. And I just found it really interesting, all the different um, modes that he used and kind of trying to encapsulate more ancient musical styles in his music. And so that was something that I definitely took some inspiration from in some of my movements, Um, although my focus is a little bit more um, on nature rather than um, his was on ancient Greek um, poetry. And my so my piece, Through the Forest, focuses on three different trees that you might find in, in a, any given forest and kind of tries to figure out, you know, what would the sounds be that might be associated with those trees, whether they're sounds that you might see, might sort of see from looking at them or from hear from the way the wind interacts with the trees or something like that. So that's something that I'd be curious to have people listen for throughout the piece. Great explanation, and you really take the concept of the wood wind to a new new level with, with that many references and sub-references. Well done. Uh, so, Alex? So, um, 
I came into this class senior year, same as a lot of us, as a music, neuroscience and music major. So this was like my opportunity finally to create some of my own music and coming from quite a broad background. Um, I've had experience sort of in the English choral canon. So I had the choir stuff. I had um, classical work with uh, Duke Wynn Symphony and other sort of symphonic and uh, Wynton ensemble background. But then what I really leaned on in my composition starting in 281 and moving on towards this semester is a lot of influence in jazz, minimalism, and sort of modern tonality. So when I started in 281 um, as part of a neuroscience and music uh, interdepartmental major, um, I was really excited to go into composition after doing theory and history so that I could really build on what I had learned previously. Um, and it was interesting though, starting with just the one line composition uh, to, to go back to sort of the basics and work on building a line before getting into more complicated textures or more complicated harmonies. But once I was able to get into more complicated harmonies and textures, um, I definitely found my compositional voice a lot. Um, I had inspiration from really everything from the English choral canon with Jonathan Dove. There's some like snarky puppy sort of funk vibes going on in my piece. A lot of influence from Michael Torque and Carl Nielsen. So it's sort of this modernist, almost postmodern uh, approach to tonality, though it is still diatonic uh, for the most part. And I think you'll hear as well in this piece, it's um, the second movement of what is currently working to be a three movement piece. Um, written for flute, alto sax, clarinet, bass, clarinet, and piano, all of which are instruments that I can play to some degree of um, fluency, flute less so. But I think you'll see that I worked quite hard to make sure that all of the instruments are playing idiomatically as much as possible, that especially for bass clarinet, which is my, my personal baby, um, I really work to use that instrument, instrument to its full potential.